My name is Tsuyoshi Sunohara. I'm, uh, uh, for the record, I'm sitting here as a Secretary General for US Japan Project, a Jap a Japan Center for Economic Research, JSA, which is an affiliated body of Nikkei Inc. I'm still a semi journalist, but I'm uh, sitting here again as Secretary General. So whatever I would say, you know, with my capacity and not related to my company. Anyway, so I'd like to introduce my uh, colleagues here, both from the United States and Japan. And uh, it's always nice to be back here, my second hometown, Washington, and it's always nice to, for me to see my uh, old Washington friends. Uh, first of all, uh, Sheila Sumisan, nice to see you again, and welcome. And uh, Sakura-san, during uh, in 90, 90s, and uh, Robin Sakura used to be my very strict teacher at Pentagon when I was a young journalist to cover Pentagon, so it's always nice to be with you. And from Japanese side, uh, we have a very famous uh, Navy Army Club uh, from Navy or Japan Self-Defense Maritime Self-Defense Admiral Koda uh, from Japanese uh, Self-Defense um, Grand Force and uh, General Yamaguchi Nobo, and welcome. And uh, <clears throat> first I'd like to ask uh, those four panelists to make uh, brief comments and on the uh, future course of U.S. Japan. Then we, we're gonna touch on three categories. Number one is again, future cooperation and the possibility and the potential of the U.S. Japan alliance across the Pacific. Number two is uh, how to deal with rise of China. And number three, uh, Korean Peninsula. So first I'd like to ask you, Shila-san, to start with your remarks, please. Thank you very much, Sunara-san, and thank you for including me. Um, I will warn the audience that I just got back from Tokyo. So I, I think I'm a little bit, they wanted me to speak first before I fell asleep. So, um, But I thought what I'd do here is talk a little bit about what Kitoka Sensei and Mike were talking about in the first panel. I've just come back from a week or so of really trying to take a look at the political dialogue in Tokyo on collective self-defense on the alliance. And I talked to uniformed uh, thinkers as well as civilians, as well as some of Japan's politicians. And you know, there's, there's been a couple of things for me um, from the perspective of somebody who sits inside the Beltway at the Council on Foreign Relations that I think is interesting about this current debate. It's different. All of the factors I think that Kitoka Sensei outlined about Mr. Abe's leadership, about the change in the region, the context within which Japan and the United States now have to think about the alliance, all of those are very relevant. Let me talk a little bit about the politics as I see them. When we sit here in Washington, we tend to think that alliance changes are too slow. <laughs> Japan is incremental, doesn't change. It's very grudging change when it happens, right? Um, but of late, you, you'll read a lot of media headlines that are a little bit alarmist about Mr. Abe, right? About his leadership, about Mr. Abe, Mr. Abe moving too fast. Right? So there's always this debate, I think, about Japan's defense, especially the military component, transformations and changes in policy debate. And I'm here not to reassure you that the third Goldilocks version is correct, but that some things actually are moving rapidly. Um, and they have been long on the back burner, perhaps, but they are moving quickly. And I think it's for two reasons. One is I think there's largely a consensus. And I think Kitelok Sensei was right to point out the fact that many of the policies being discussed were policies discussed under a DPJ leadership, as well as under an LDP leadership. And the reason they're being discussed is because many people in Japan feel the time has come these policy changes are really overdue. And so the regional context within which some of these changes are being made, I think is first and foremost, one of the motivators or drivers, if you will, of the pace of change in Japan. Um, I think lots of people worry about Mr. Abe's politics. I don't think that's what I saw when I was in Tokyo um, this, this last week in terms of the dynamics at home in Japan. So let me give you a feel for what I saw this week. Um, Abe-san, when, once he received the report that Mr. Kitoka's commission presented him with, which was a very thorough, extensive look at the questions on use of force, on where and how and when Japan should embed its military capability in global cooperation, uh, Mr. Abe selected a very narrow range of recommendations on that report for the first piece of the conversation, at least, the piece that's going on now with the Komeito. So already I think you see the political factors that are b coming to bear in terms of how this conversation over collective self-defense will move forward. Um, I got to Japan a week ago, last weekend, um, and already the Komeito and the LDP, the ruling coalition, had had a fairly um, smooth conversation about gray zone activities, right? Things that, um, even though Kitoko-san was critical of, they felt that were prior to the initiation of a conflict. 
um, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between the Colmeto thinking and the LDP. Uh, on collective self-defense, you'll see the conversation moving this week in a day-by-day -day sort of manner. Uh, on Monday, uh, Mr. Komura came out with his tatakidai, or his draft of three new principles that would govern Japan's use of force, and that is collective as well as individual. Uh, very little changes, frankly, from the three principles that had been the accepted parameters on the use of force. The one place, however, where the Komeito and LDP are struggling, frankly, to reach a conclusion, I suspect, is on this area of collective self-defense. And that is both the timing of Japan's military becoming engaged with the United States and also the mission-specific uh, conditions under which the Komeito feels comfortable. So as you watch this week, be very alert to timing in terms of initiation and placing of the Japanese self-defense forces along with the Americans or other foreign countries, and also be very, very attentive to the way the Komeito is moving forward with its kind of comfort about a very restrictive uh, use of uh, collective, the right of collective self-defense. I too, I think perhaps like Hitoka Sensei, I was rather disappointed that Mr. Abe didn't include collective security. Uh, I don't think that Japan is not going to think about collective security in the future, but for this round, in this year, in this conversation, I suspect it was a, a, a bridge too far. I will also note, finally, on Mr. Abe's announcement, um, is that he stressed the minimal necessary use of force, which is a principle, I think, that has a broad consensus inside Japan, uh, do, uh, among political parties, as well as among the public. This is not a situation where Japan is willing to really move beyond uh, its post-war interpretation that, the article, that Article 9 allows itself, allows the right of self-defense, but not the unlimited use of force for that purpose. So I think these are the kinds of constraints within which Mr. Abe is working, and it has already been defined in a very limited way uh, from the broad sweep of options that Mr. Abe could have thought about. The one other piece of the puzzle in Japan that I don't yet have a conclusion about, but for those of you watching in the months ahead, um, because there will be a parliamentary debate about revised laws in the fall, and you will continue to hear debate in Japan, not about specific missions, but about the process by which this decision is being made. And this is the political consensus part of what's going to happen, not just the military rationale for a change in Japanese policy, but the political consensus building process that I suspect is the first step is the, is the Komeito discussion, but it'll be a broader discussion going forward. Um, the cat, whether a cabinet decision is sufficient, you already hear critics talking about we need a broader parliamentary bill, right? It ought to take place in a broader framework in the, in the diet. Um, and I think there's always this, in, this question of is interpretation the right way to go? And I think inside from both left, progressive left parties, as well as those who are more conservative in origin, there is a conversation about perhaps we should just simply reinterpret or re revise the Constitution rather than relying on reinterpretation. I suspect that these process level concerns are going to continue to be a source of criticism for the Abe cabinet, but I don't know yet how they're going to resolve themselves in ter terms of policy. It's in, in conclusion, this is the third round of conversation between the United States and Japan on the bilateral defense cooperation guidelines. Those of you, many of you in the room know this already, but for those of you who don't, the first one, of course, was in 1978. The second one was in the mid-1990s, and my colleagues to the right here participated in that process. What's different, I, ses I sense, on this round is that it's largely being driven by Japan's needs. And I'm not saying that to say the United States doesn't have a role in shaping the conversation in Tokyo, certainly. Um, the United States is actively engaged in talking with uh, Japanese counterparts. But really the streamlining of laws, the refinement of principles, the question about wh just how much and how far Japan has to prepare to use force is really being driven by an internal process within Japan, both among the security planners and those extended experts outside of the planning community. Um, streamlining laws is a, is, is a result in large part about experiences that the Japanese self-defense forces have already had. We forget that the Japanese self-defense force has been a very active participant in PKO. It has been a very active ally with the United States. And really what a lot of the process that I see, the specific targets of reform, are really dedicated to those areas where the SDF and the civilian planners have understood that these limits imposed are, it are barriers to effective cooperation. They are not being drawn out uh, of nowhere. They actually come from experience. 
finally, let me conclude by talking a little bit about, I think, where Mike was leaving us off here, which is what is the function of the guidelines? What is the function of these changes in the bilateral relationship as well as in Japan's own thinking? Um, and that is the, how do we think about the United States and Japan as we move forward ensuring Japanese defense and effective alliance cooperation? How do we make sure that this reassures the region as opposed to startles the region? And I think clearly what's different from the 1990s is the Japan-South Korea relationship is on a different footing. The last couple of years of estrangement in that relationship have made communication about strategic interests and strategic cooperation more difficult than in the past. So I think it will behoove both Japanese and American policymakers, as well as the expert community, to seek out partners in South Korea, both in the public domain as well as inside the government, to make sure that that reassurance message is there. And I think Kyoko Sensei said it very clearly, there is no intent in Tokyo in taking the Japanese military anywhere <laughs> uh, near the, the Korean Peninsula without the express permission of the Korean government. China, I suspect, will not want to be reassured. And I think we should just accept that. That doesn't mean, however, that the United States and Japan then do not have to put effort into the kinds of engagement processes that we have already supported in the past. The mill-mill dialogue, uh, the broader regional context of both humanitarian and, and disaster relief assistance, finding opportunity like the RIMPAC exercises for greater Chinese participation. It will be just as incumbent upon both, both sides of the alliance to pursue those avenues of engagement. But I don't think we should be too optimistic about Beijing's desire for engagement, at least not on the terms that the U.S. and Japan are comfortable with at the moment. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yuan. So, Admiral, it's your turn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sinohara. Um, I am Admiral Yoji Koda. Perhaps I'm not so well known in this arena. I was just a lazy former destroyer driver. And also the brother-in-law, <laughs> just you know, the, of the sack, you know, for years, we promised. So. But uh, um, just the Shira mentioned something about the defense guidelines. That especially for Japan and the United States, the, my point, which I'm going to speak today, is how well should Japan and the United States build our future posture to meet the coming Chinese challenges, security challenges. And of course, the, af especially after the Cold War, end of Cold War or the demise of the Soviet Union, the US-Japan alliance has been a key stabilizer for the security of the region together with the security of Japan. And this is very clear. And, but especially after the mid-1990s, U.S. and Japan have started facing the new challenges generated by rising China. And this Chinese strategy is characterized as the A to AD strategy. And how well are we going to able to meet? And the, but, Perhaps the Shira mentioned the Japanese high interpretation of the Japanese, you know, the, the, the political situation, or, or revision of the Japanese new defense policy, and I'm going to speak from mainly from the military force build-up point of view, and both Mr. Kitaoka and Shira mentioned the last year the new security, uh, Japanese new security strategy and defense guide. Uh, NDPG and the five-year program were issued. And yes, that's it. You know, the, for the first time in la, the, after the World War II history of Japan, the Japanese government issued the security document. In that sense, I to grade the document as A. But at the same time, when I look, the, especially the security strategy, there are several things which are missing from the military point of view. And th that's the subject of my today's speech. And first, what is A to AD? Is that the operational plan? No. That's a Chinese rationale to build its own military to meet 
the U.S. capability perhaps 10 to 20 years from now. So to, to is today China giant? No, they are not so capable. But they are today building the military under the rationale of A2AD to meet the U.S. capability in 10 or 20 years from now. That's the, so please do not confuse. This is not a old plan or campaign plan. This is the, the force build up rationale. This is one thing we should remember. And what is the objective? Of course, the U.S. forces operating and you know the stationing in this area, in this area, not Russian, in our area. Okay, what are the U.S. forces in our area? There are basically two forces. One U.S. force is in the U.S. forces in Korea. They are the tailored force against North Korea. So perhaps the less flexibility in terms of the deployment, other than the Korean Peninsula. And U.S. forces stationed in Japan. Is that is those fo are those forces are the dedicated forces to only defend Japan? No, that's the real driving force which really realized the U.S. global structure uh, strategy. Without the U.S. forces in Japan, perhaps the, the U.S. regional and global strategy would be very difficult. And what are the U.S. forces in Japan? Please think about that. Do you know the size of Japan? What U.S. state? is the closest to Japan. Many say California, no. Montana, state of Montana, okay. But think about that, okay. State of Montana and Japan's 65% is mountain. There are six jet US bases, okay. 55,000 US service personnel, two naval bases. And that's the US forces, okay, which those U.S. forces stationed in Japan are the real enabler of the U.S. global structure. And that's the Japanese responsibility and also the U.S. responsibility to maintain those forces in the area and to maintain the stability of the region. Okay, then there, are, there will be Chinese challenges under the rationale of the ATAD. Okay? And my observation, three areas. One is the area where we should focus mainly on the maritime domain. Okay. The first, China is pretty well known by its development of the anti-ship ballistic missile. That's a new challenge for US and Japan. US and Japan are doing the ballistic missile defense. But the story would be very different to protect US carriers or amphib forces from the Chinese anti-ship ballistic missile because the terminal phases, okay, the tra trajectory is no more ballistic. That made us, our defense posture, very difficult. Do we do nothing for the future? No, that's the new area where US and Japan should allocate a lot of resources, okay. Please think about that, okay. If the US lose, loses two carriers, heavily damaged by one, What's your rationale in, or sentiment in Washington, D.C.? Do you still maintain the strong motive to come in? We believe so, but maybe not. In order to minimize those risks, both U.S. and Japan have to have the good new posture to maintain our fleet under the idea of new fleet anti-ballistic ship missile. That's something we should do for the future. Second is anti-submarine warfare, which is something still true today from the Cold War days. Japan is responsible for the anti-submarine warfare in the Pacific, and which substantially reduced Chinese submarine threat, which convinced the US leaders to deploy your forces to the area. It's our responsibility but coordination is also necessary. That's the, the, the first area. And second area is basically Japanese mainland or homeland defense. What's homeland de defense? Okay, this is very different from the Cold War days. In Cold War days, the Sheila mentioned, and also you understand, we focused mainly on the North. The invasion from, we, we prepared ourselves against the invasion from the Soviet, and we did that. But today, no, the Western Islands, okay. And what's the threat? Chinese ballistic missile 
cruise missile and sabotage. The sabotage is a very new thing for Japan. And Japan has exposes many Achilles heels, like the nuclear power plants or the fossil oil fuel burning the power plants or hub for the transportation or you know, the high speed train, everything. Very vulnerable. And the China may deploy its special forces, not the, the, the major invasion, but small group of special forces are good enough to really destroy our core key hub of those infrastructure. Okay. Maybe the Fukushima disaster, okay, that size of the confusion could happen or 10 times as large or 100 times as large as that, that one. That's something we have to prepare. And another part is the choke point for Chinese military. To realize its A2A strategy, they need to have a capability to pen penetrate the Okinawa Island chain. Those straits we call the choke point, who control which. And that's Japanese responsibility. By so doing, what Japanese contribution? Enable US forces to operate any area in our region. Okay. That's the Japanese defense and the responsibility. But in order to realize that responsibility, Japan has to protect and defend our own mainland as well as the Western Island. That's the value of the Japanese operation. So we need to have the clear understanding between Washington DC and Tokyo, how well we will establish, how soon and where to protect. Those are the, the kind of the agreement should be incorporated into the defense guideline and roles mission capa capability review. And the third one is, okay, we are now basically reacting in the maritime area and homeland, homeland defense. But, okay, that's part of a strategy. What is lacking now in, in my story is a kind of the offensive. Okay, China also has a huge Achilles heel, for example, their treasure, industrial area, stretching from the Hong Kong to Tianjin. Okay. Many said, many Americans said, or Japanese media said, we will, Japan is vulnerable against Chinese cruise missile attack, yes. But how about China? Those Chinese treasure area from Hong Kong to Tianjin, how about the US swarm tomahawk attack? You know, that's the way how we deter China. So without those capabilities, okay, we may invite Chinese adventurism. So this is some, this, you know, the, my third area, okay, the offensive capability by fully utilizing their Achilles heel. So how about the, their slugs? In Cold War days, Soviet Union, Union was not the slugs dependent country. Okay. Their slug in the Far East is almost nothing. But today, where are the Chinese slugs? Indian Ocean, many. Pacific Ocean, many. How many submarines do we have? We are going to have 23, 22. US, perhaps 30 in the area. India, many. So China will also expose its vulnerability of the slugs to us. So my point is, okay, we, we do not fight, but at least in order for us to deter China, we should have capability. This is our rationale. And also the choke point, wisely control the choke point in the southwestern island. This re will really block and disable Chinese operations, for Chinese capability to operate the naval and the air forces, which realize their A to AD strategy. And, you know, I think you understand okay, what I told you now. Okay, these are not difficult operations for us because we have capability. And if our leadership, both political and military leadership is wise enough, we will be able to realize this third point, offensive capability. And then we will be able to deter China. So those three areas, okay, that's a 
uh, kind of new and old idea mixed together, but should be incorporated into our undergoing the defense guideline the, and the uh, was, uh, roads mission capability review, bilateral effort. And if those, you know, the, the new ideas and the old ideas are pretty well taken into those two strategies, coming doc documents, I think uh, cooperative posture will be very, would be, become very robust and will contribute to the stability and security of the region as well as the, the security of Japan. This is my point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kuroda. Uh, so please go ahead, Saksan. Thanks uh, to Mike and your team for having me. Uh, Kito Sensei for uh, your, your presentation and your hard work in, in uh, uh, helping to reform this alliance in a, in a really positive direction. Um, I, I think this is a really, truly remarkable time uh, for the Alliance when it comes to the reforms that are being considered, uh, some that have already recently been done, and the outcome uh, for all of these have not yet uh, been set. Um, as I look around the room, um, you know, I've, I've been focused on U.S.-Japan uh, Alliance management for about 20 years, uh, but I see some faces of, of folks that have much deeper uh, experience in me, uh, Tom Hubbard, uh, Stanley Roth, uh, Russ Deming, Robin, uh, and I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I think you would agree this is, this is quite a remarkable time. Uh, part of it is for reasons that Sheila outlined uh, for why this time uh, is different than the previous rounds as she uh, referred to them. Uh, I was not present at the first round. Uh, but uh, I was I was at the at the second, and and because as I look around this uh, audience, I see a lot of younger faces, and I'm very encouraged by that. Uh, let me let me give a quick sense of uh, how how and why this is so different. Um, I, I remember when we issued the Joint Security Declaration in '96, the Gehinkan in Tokyo, uh, and and there was a press conference that uh, was in the um, outside of the, the, uh, the facility. And uh, one journalist asked uh, Prime Minister Hashimoto, uh, the Joint Security Declaration is a declaration that set forth uh, both sides to review the guidelines. And one journalist asked uh, the Prime Minister, why did you decide to, to review the guidelines at this time? And I remember the, the Prime Minister paused I, I got a little nervous for him, but he paused, and he was thinking, and, and finally he, he said, we've decided to review the guidelines because it's unclear what are the areas that we can and cannot do uh, when it comes to defense and the alliance. And that, that shocked me. That was stunning to me because I thought, as the Japan country director in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, Maybe I didn't know, but surely the Prime Minister knew why one of the things that, that uh, Japan and the U.S. could and couldn't do. Um, but I took that as homework, and then we moved forward with uh, reviewing the guidelines with my colleagues, then Colonel Yamaguchi and Captain uh, Koda, and, and uh, we did the deal. But the context then was that we were trying to figure out what it is that we could and couldn't do. We were trying to bring clarity to the situation that we had at hand. This is very different. This is changing the framework uh, with which, within which we will operate. Uh, back then it was how are we going to cooperate uh, bilaterally, regionally, and globally uh, as an alliance. Uh, and, and again, within the framework uh, that was in place. Uh, this is changing the framework. This is trying to figure out adjustments to collective self-defense. Uh, Japan has recently made an adjustment uh, to its arms export control principles. Uh, and that will change how we are able to cooperate, how we can become more efficient uh, and a better uh, alliance. The, the point uh, that I'd like to 
to make uh, in my three <coughs> minutes remaining here is, uh, so what? The so what of after these uh, reforms are made, uh, how, how, how can that change the alliance and how we do business? When uh, I think most people look at adjustments, potential adjustments in the collective self-defense uh, and how Japan uh, deals with that, uh, it, it brings to mind, okay, these then are areas that we can cooperate in more. Um, and the thing that comes to mind probably foremost is how do we deal with the specific situation now? Given this situation, how do we respond to it? Well, we can do more together. Um, and that's the context of contingency planning. How, we, how do we prepare for something may, that may pop up? And contingency planning is how do we respond to a situation with the force at hand? Uh, back in the day, in, in, in 96, 97, when we were working on guidelines, that's pretty much what the guidelines was all about. Uh, mostly, how do we change uh, the way that we do contingency planning? But the combination of a lot of these reforms really changes a lot of things on how uh, the alliance can uh, become more efficient, more effective. Uh, arms export control principles, uh, because they've re been relaxed more formally, um, that has an implication for how we go about doing defense planning. Uh, and defense planning is more about what is the future force that we need to have? Uh, what are the capabilities that uh, we should have? How do we develop those capabilities and how do we bring them to fore? Uh, and so the implication here is that collective self-defense will identify areas where we can do more in the here and now for a specific situation with forces that we have on hand. But it also identifies openings for what are the, what are the capabilities uh, that we should have in the future and should, be working, should we be working on those things together? And that gets into more of defense planning. And defense planning is a very sensitive, very secretive uh, work. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that both sides turn over their work to, to the other, but um, I think Missile defense, for example, was uh, uh, an opportunity that Japan, by uh, ad hoc, uh, specifically accepted missile defense from, uh, from its arms export control principles that allowed us to move forward with um, uh, uh, working together on research and development, working together on, de on production, and working together on, on cooperation of, of that system. This now opens it up to, uh, I think, greater possibilities. And those are the things I think we need to, we need to think about. One, one question in the earlier uh, uh, session kind of suggested that, but I, I think this opens it up to uh, a lot greater possibilities to become more effective. Thank you, Dr. So thank you for your patience, General Yamaguchi. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. <coughs> then, uh, I'm, I, too, am very glad to be here uh, to see uh, many of uh, um, not, um, not I, I'm to not talking about age, but the old friend of mine. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I, have, uh, I have given, <coughs> I was given five minutes to talk, and I, I, I have maybe one hour uh, strength, uh, length. But I, I, I will strictly limit uh, three things, uh, uh, three determined things. One, North Korea is going to uh, be threat. For, for the foreseeable future. Two, China is rising. Three, uh, United States is going to be my, uh, Japan's ally. That's three. Uh, one, North Korea, we have to get together. Um, Japan, US, uh, South Korea, along with that, uh, other countries, even, even Chinese, uh, China, uh, we have to deal with North Korea's threat, period. The second, China's rise is uh, given but uh, to what, uh, to which direction China rises is not given. Uh, we can, uh, we, if we are uh, strong enough and if we are uh, smart enough and we, we, we can get together, uh, we can shape the, shape the course. Uh, that, is not, uh, that is good for us, but it's not for only us, but for, for, for Chinese too. So we have to do, uh, uh, do uh, our best uh, to shape the course of uh, China's rise. Uh, in that sense, 
uh, Japan, what can Japan do is uh, uh, two, two things. We have to engage uh, China and we have to hedge China. And the, uh, hedging and engagement are not necessarily mutually exclusive, uh, but rather mutually reinforcing uh, because Chinese, um, as I uh, have uh, been uh, dealing with Chinese friends, uh, they, are, um, they, are not, uh, they, they cannot be, uh, be serious uh, to talk to me when I'm so stupid and I am so weak. I have to be, I have to at least look, uh, look smart and I have, to, uh, I have to be strong. So getting stronger uh, for the Japan is uh, very important to, to engage China. In that sense, the last thing comes. Uh, our relations uh, with the uh, with United States, along with our own defense capabilities, may enforce our capability to hedge and engage China. That is really important. In that context, guidelines, uh, uh, which uh, Tak and uh, Koda-san and, and I, I uh, used to work hard, um, 96, 97, um, that, that work is really, really important. Uh, in that sense, uh, just uh, you know, one suggestion for the uh, next generation uh, uh, you know, people uh, who uh, might have to work really hard, like uh, security, uh, annual security, uh, is that there are differences uh, particularly differences between uh, U.S. and Japan, and perhaps even among Japanese, you know, among, uh, among uh, Americans, differences on threat perception, and differences on uh, policy priorities, and differences on uh, sensitivities in, in their minds in terms of talking about declaratory policy. So, but first thing we need to do is uh, understand the differences. And uh, then secondly, we have to overcome uh, the differences uh, to reach the consensus, uh, which path we should, uh, we should uh, take the uh, energy first and uh, uh, prioritize the uh, mission. And um, we have to do uh, every effort to make, uh, make the concrete case um, the, on which uh, uh, Japan and the US uh, should work together. And, what can do is a, uh, the question, uh, was a question for us. But this, this time, in addition to what uh, can Japan do, or what can the United States do, um, we might have to think about what Japan should or wants to do, what, and also what uh, the, does the United States want to do. Those things uh, should be discussed uh, again. We are not uh, living in a, the a, uh, limited box. Uh, so we have to be creative, and uh, particularly this is important when we talked about uh, when when we talk about the how we engage uh, rising China. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dino uh, Yamaguchi. Um, first, and I need to complain to Mike that the, uh, this time shortage, and <laughs> because of this time shortage, that our time is running out. It's only 20 minutes to go. So I'd like to ask you, uh, four panelists, to discuss simultaneously what I said earlier. U.S. Japan future course on the China rise and North Korea thing, and I believe that the uh, <coughs> as a moderator, as a journalist from Tokyo, that the uh, Japan's strategic goal is to keep uh, peace and prosperity in this Asia Pacific region, together with the uh, closest friends and ally in this region, United States of America. And because of the internal political warfare in Tokyo, there's so many negative reports on what's going on inside the Abe administ administration in Tokyo, including what Mr. Kitaoka has explained kindly today to you all. But dear, please do not misunderstand. What we are trying to achieve is not another invasion, another fight, not at all, but to keep uh, prosperity and peace in that region so that everybody, every player in that region can enjoy any outcome of those kind of peace and prosperity. That, for that sake, we are trying to set up a new, what I say, joint deterrence. Together, again, you, United States of America. Having said that, uh, would you please, uh, anybody, uh, start on the future course with US Japan, and including, uh, of course, simultaneously, you can touch upon how to deal with rise of China and uh, North Korea contingency, or whatever. Anybody? Please go ahead. Um, I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, our relations, or our relations with South Korea, 
or the, the relations between US-Japan alliance and uh, ROC-Japan alliance are really, really important. Um, for Korean conting contingency, Japan um, should become the backyard for, for, uh, for the main fighters. And in, in terms of security of Japan, um, China uh, provides 100 percent, uh, no, Korea, South Korea uh, provides 100 percent uh, secure flank um, on, uh, on uh, Kyushu, particularly north of Kyushu. Those imp um, important and mutual reliance uh, should be uh, widely shared by the Koreans and Japanese, and we have to, to uh, think of that. And in that sense, the guidelines review uh, may, may give us a golden opportunity. Um, I remember that 1996 and 97, when uh, we worked, worked to, uh, uh, to revise the guidelines with Sak and uh, uh, Mike Green here, and Koreans were so, so uh, sensitive about uh, uh, what, what Japan and uh, US were doing. And they are very much interested in uh, what we are discussing. So um, you know, both governments decided to have trilateral. And whenever we talked about uh, what uh, Japan and the U.S. Um, US uh, doing uh, to Koreans, all the generals and uh, admirals uh, started uh, taking notes. In that, uh, at the same time, the U.S. and Korea uh, did start, it, start a kind of a new uh, operational planning or uh, thinking. Uh, that, that was totally new to Japanese. So when uh, Co Korean, uh, Korean, uh, Korean uh, Bifa uh, began uh, his explanation about what U.S. and, uh, uh, US and Korea uh, were discussing, all the participants from the Japanese uh, side, including me, uh, all of a sudden uh, start taking notes. So we are very much interested in uh, what uh, would happen in Korean on Korean Peninsula. They are very much uh, interested in um, what would happen um, between U.S. and Japan. So this, uh, this uh, will become a very, very strong incentive uh, to, uh, for the both defense military authorities of uh, Korea, and, uh, Korea and Japan and to deepen the under mutual understanding. That might uh, lead uh, kind of uh, the better relations uh, between the two, uh, two people. Thank you. Shiva san do you have any? I just very briefly, thank you. I think there's a couple of thoughts I had on the just the alliance management side, mostly because Noboru was just talking about the Japan ROK relationship. It seems to me that there's a little learning that can go on between the U.S. and ROK and the U.S. and Japan. Since 2010, the United States and, and South Korean governments have been talking about a provocation, anti-provocation measures, right? In the wake of the Chonan sinking and then in the wake of the Yongsan shelling. Uh, the South Korean government and the U.S. government had to think of very different sal kinds of contingencies rather than the straightforward war contingency between North and South. And I think there's a lot of learning perhaps, maybe not indirectly because the command structure is different and the situation may be different, but I think an anti-provocation strategy and a way of talking about provocative behavior below the level uh, of actual conflict is going to be very useful for the guidelines review in and of itself. For those of us who sit here in Washington, we will have heard a lot about U.S. considerations and, and U.S. planners wor worried about emboldening allies and thinking about this new risk setting in Northeast Asia. And again, I think here the guidelines review is, is one piece of the prescription for the guidelines review is for us to have a much clearer sense of how the two militaries will interact. But I also think it's going to be imperative for the U.S. and Japan to talk very carefully about our political crisis management scenarios. And I think a lot of the discussion that's going on inside Tokyo today about gray zone contingencies uh, will help the U.S. and Japan have a very careful conversation about what would happen if in a variety of settings that the alliance really hasn't had to deal with, and specifically those are maritime kinds of contingencies. One last piece of the framework we haven't really talked about, and I don't know, Senator Hanasan, if you wanted to talk about it here, but, but everybody to the right of me has a lot of experience thinking about these things. Um, but risk reduction frameworks are clearly one piece of the puzzle, not just for us in partnership, but also in partnership with ASEAN countries, and that's a place also where we obviously have to get China at the table. We can't have a one-sided risk reduction regime in the Asia-Pacific. But on the other hand, I think there's lots of things we can do in terms of maritime domain awareness, the technologies, 
the open transparencies. Uh, there's a lot we can do with partners in Southeast Asia as well, and we shouldn't hesitate or wait until China decides it wants to have risk reduction uh, measures. We should engage a lot more forcefully across the region, and hopefully that will provide venues of, of dialogue with, with the People's Republic of China. Thank you. Thank you, Sira Sun. Um, <coughs> any additional comments? Talk about? No? Other meal? No? Um, then we'd like to go to Q&A, please. And just one point uh, for, for uh, related to risk reduction. Uh, this is really important. Uh, and uh, military to military dialogue um, is quite important. Uh, in that sense, um, I have not given up yet. Um, even uh, the relation uh, with the China and, uh, and, and Korea. Uh, Korea has kept sending uh, three cadets to uh, National Defense Academy. Um, they bring a number of Japanese friends back home. And uh, we sent uh, uh, three, three uh, students to Korean, uh, three different academies. And uh, China has kept sending um, the scholars uh, for the, uh, our National Defense Academies uh, international conferences for uh, military academies. Uh, this year, too, um, in next, early next month, we, we will have senior colonel from uh, um, Chinese National Defense University. And uh, they have uh, um, kept invited uh, students, uh, our, our students or cadets, uh, to their own international conferences. So um, we, uh, we are doing our best uh, to, to uh, keep the uh, communication channel. And uh, they are doing the same. They are seemingly uh, doing the same thing. Okay, thank you. If I could. Yeah, and uh, just with regard to the risk re reduction uh, with China, the I was a frequent visitor to China. Some, to, you know, the, many of you visited Beijing. That in Japan there is no of formal or official male male relationship. So I, as a retired senior officer, you know, the, I visited Beijing last year two th five times, and the year before uh, three times, and mainly we discussed the risk re reduction. But the the the, re the reality or fact is, China never try to separate the Senkaku issue with all the other security issues. So that makes our, you know, the dialogue very difficult. Very difficult. This is the reality. Please understand. Okay. Um, so now floor is open. For anybody uh, who would like to ask any questions, please uh, so go ahead. <coughs> Hi, I'm Brent Pasco from the law firm K. Scholler. Um, there's been brief mention of industrial defense cooperation, but not much discussion of it today. Um, I've just observed that you know, a, a typical feature of U.S. Um, military alliances is deep industrial cooperation. Um, and so, for example, there are several hundred companies in the United States uh, that are foreign owned and do classified work for the US government. I don't think probably even 1% of those companies are Japanese. I'm curious what can be done to deepen the industrial cooperation between Japan and the United States in furtherance of the alliance. Please. Uh, you know, the, the best way to describe is, you know, the You know, the Japanese participation should should be the area where the U.S. are not so good at. For example, conventional submarine, okay. or some specific you know, the guidance equipment or you know the chip or whatever. That in Japan, Japan, Japanese defense in industry, okay, even the Mitsubishi, I think their share is very very low in the, the total sales. So perhaps the, and also, you know, the no major m and among the Japanese ma major industries. So if you take a look at the each independent company or capability of each in independent company, uh, they are not so strong or good. But, you know, but as I mentioned, for example, the conventional submarine, which Australia, Australia really wants, you know, Japan is the only nation 
which can provide the technology and also the building capability. So, you know, the U.S. and Japan should wisely allocate their area of responsibility depending on the area where the U.S. is good at and Japan is good at. And this is all, all, all I can say. Yeah. Thank you. So next question. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you so much, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Uh, thanks for a great discussion, uh, especially thanks to my friend Johnny Yamaguchi for reminding us about the Korea angle. But just on that last point quickly, uh, uh, it's also something we'd love to see, but I'd sure like to hear the Armed Services Committee reaction to uh, American contractors not getting a contract because Mitsubishi got it. And, you know, that's always the terrible conundrum, isn't it? We want all our allies to help except for it cost us a job. Uh, but anyway, uh, on the Korea angle, um, how important is Japanese Korean military professionalism? Uh, it, it, can it influence the politics that's currently in the way of uh, a more rational alliance relationship? Uh, are there things that uh, at the mill-mill level, uh, uh, at the senior friends level, at the retired level, that uh, it would be good to see to try to calm down some of these things that uh, are so un uh, difficult. Uh, you know, we've got Mr. Suga and his little investigation due to uh, be announced by the end of the week, and maybe nothing's going to happen. Maybe all hell's going to break loose, and that's going to set everything back. So, uh, just on that on that issue alone, uh, and then in the in the strictly military sense. Um, is there any point yet in talking about Korean naval strength and air strength as part of the combined asset of, yeah. of U.S.-Japan assets? Uh, we never hear anything about that, and yet I've always been told Koreans have a hell of a good Navy. Why don't we hear about that, and is it too, too soon to be thinking about them as part of this force? Thank you. General, you ready? <laughs> Are you ready to answer? Okay. Um, I I I uh, I admire uh, the kind of uh, professionalism of uh, current Korean uh, forces. They are so professional and uh, and apolitical. Uh, that is the, uh, what I, I I admire. But they they are under political control. So I have a feeling that you know the higher the rank becomes, um, they they are uh, they tend to be more sensitive, the more sensitive uh, to, uh, to the direction uh, which uh, political leadership takes. So in that sense, you know, I, I would say Colonel or below are okay now. The you know, brigadier or the major general or above, they are very much cautious. But that is uh, uh, that that is the nature of uh, you know uh, uh, democratic uh, military. So that, that that is a good sense. But anyway, at, as soon as political uh, uh, political leadership say say says go go ahead, uh, we are we are we are totally ready to uh, to do many things together. And as to um, navy and the air force, of course uh, we we are neighbors and we are uh, allies allies. So um, the. Um, there was actually a, a discussion from Korean side uh, several uh, several uh, several years ago. Um, um, he was talking about air force to air force uh, uh, cooperation of air patrolling. Uh, it's not a, it's not a, a wartime mission, but uh, he was talking about uh, east side of uh, Korean Peninsula and west side of Korean Peninsula, um, um, which uh, can be uh, can be patrolled by jo joint uh, joint air forces. Uh, that was uh, three years ago, but uh, uh, those uh, professionals uh, dealing with air or the maritime um, uh, issues um, may must have a uh, good idea to how to cooperate in the future if the political climate permits. Uh, okay, one last question up there. Arthur Herman Hudson Institute. Um, very fascinating discussion, uh, but nothing has been said so far about security cooperation on cyber threats, whether one's talking about advanced persistent threats or non-state actors. And I'm wondering what the panel's view is on what would constitute a suitable framework for that kind of security cooperation. 
Anybody? It is, yes, it is really important. Th this and also this building is a very appropriate place uh, because uh, Dr. Hamre, uh, when he, he was the number two at the DOD, he was very much uh, um, eager to teach us, uh, teach us about how uh, we should deal with cyber threat. Um, just after uh, DOD was uh, attacked by by a high school hijacker, and uh, to um, whom um, it took uh, uh, more than 10, 10 months to to find out uh, who, who, who was a high, uh, who, who was a, uh, who, who who did it. Uh, so since uh, since that time, uh, we have been discussing cy cyber uh, uh, cooperation uh, over cyber threat, and Japan is uh, getting slowly ready to do uh, because uh, last year we established a joint, uh, small but joint command uh, to deal with cyber, uh, cyber, cyber operation. So uh, we are now getting ready to, to discuss uh, with American counterparts uh, with a single uh, contact point, uh, uh, in, uh, at least at the MOD. The especially, I didn't mention the, this area in Chinese aid to AD, but China, as a weaker side today, you know, the using those cyber or anti-satellite or the seabed fiber cable network destruction or even the EMP, those are the strategy and tactics of the weaker side. So there will be a greater chance for China to develop the capability. They already have some, but will be more and more robust in the future. So especially from the policy side and force developing side, both US and Japan has to allocate as much and many resources possible to develop the real capability to cope with the growing, you know, the, those the new domain denial area, EMP, cyber, anti-satellite, and the seabed fiber optics network destruction. You know, U.S. forces supported by JSPF, very strong. But if the China or any adversary will be able to kill, the cut the nerve, okay, U.S. muscle won't work. And China would be able to kill the U.S. forces as if they were shooting the sitting duck. That is the last thing for us to do. So we need to develop the frontline equipment together with this area. And this should be involved in the, uh, the defense guideline and world mission capability in, um, by this December. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for your participation today. Uh, we are very much, uh, uh, very much uh, pleased to be here. And uh, please join me to praise um, with hands for our four panelists. Thanks so much. So let me let me just close. Let me close briefly by thanking um, our colleagues who came across the Pacific, Sack across the river, Sheila across the street. Although I guess you just came back from the Pacific as well. Um, a lot of the agenda is not new, 1990, Keith Orko-sensei said, uh, 1996, but there's a definite urgency to it, and it's really striking uh, when you listen to the panels how much the U.S. and Japan are going to be depending on each other. Read the Quadrennial Defense Review. It's in black and white in the U.S. We're going to need each other more than ever before. For somebody like me who was a graduate student under George Packard at the end of the Cold War, when most people were predicting this alliance would fall apart and we would be economic enemies, it's remarkable. It will not put anyone in this room out of business, though, because as you've heard, the more we depend on each other, the more complicated it gets. We have a lot of things we have to figure out together, and we'll keep talking about those. So thank you all for coming, and thank you for joining us.